My name is Bud Hampton, and I'm proud to be a Marine, along with my two brothers that followed me in the Marine Corps. Well, all of you remember, remember a little bit about how the World War II started. Of course, it started in December 7, 1941. Admiral Nimitz was put in charge of the Pacific, and they sent him to Hawaii to take over. He got there and looked, looked around, and his comment was that the Japanese made three big mistakes. They missed the fuel dump, they missed the dry dock, and they bombed on a Sunday, which most of the troops were ashore. So the Admiral got his crew working on the aircraft carriers because the, the Japanese missed them because they were out of, out of port at that time and then sent the submarines up around Midway to be prepared and be on the lookout for the Japanese Navy coming in. The Japanese attacked on 4 June 1942. We were real lucky with all, with all our aircraft carriers and they hit some of the Japanese carriers when they were refueling. So they had a real good shot on that. And I think they ended up, they distorted three carriers and damaged one other. The next uh, thing that came about was the Australians noticed that the Japanese were building an airstrip on the Guadalcanal. So on 7 or 9 August, 1942, the Marines landed on Guadalcanal, and I think that was one of the biggest, biggest uh, and the longest battles to head over there. This is about time that I got ready to join the Marine Corps. So I joined the Marine Corps in July 42, Paris Island, of course, for the boot camp. I was the only one in my platoon to fire expert so they wouldn't put me on KP. The policy was after you fire the range, they, that platoon went on KP, but he said, since you did that, you can guard the barracks. After that, I was transferred to New River Tent Camp, which later became Camp Lejeune. I joined the new 4th Marine Division as a private. They put me in, they gave me a rifle squad. Why, well, I don't know, but anyway, they did. Uh, and, uh, I was promoted to PFC in November 1942 and uh, stayed with the unit and our division started all kind of training, squad tactics, soon tactics, company tactics, and regimental tactics. So we did all that for 1943. About midway 1943, they wanted to join, they wanted to form another regiment. So they took half of our 23rd regiment to make the 25th regiment. And the 25th went by the canal to California, and my regiment went by troop train to California, where we met the 24th Regiment, and then we had the whole division together. We trained there in three or four months. In January 1944, I think Admiral said, uh, it was about time we started making steps towards Japan. We hadn't made any move before. He said, we also need a new staging area closer to Japan. We landed in the Marshall Islands, went directly into combat, and they said we were the first unit to do that, and we were the first unit to capture Japanese-mandated territory, which was territory given to Japan after World War I, and we captured our objectives in the shortest period of time. It took us two days. From the Marshall Islands, we went aboard ship and sailed to Maui, Hawaii. On Maui, we set up a base camp, put up our tents and everything else, you know, to receive replacements and to continue training. In April 44, they finally promoted to a corporal. And in May 44, they promoted me to sergeant. And then about that time, the Air Force was crying, we got B-29s and we don't know where to put them. We have no place to put them that we can take off and bomb Japan and return without refueling. So they call on the Marines. June 15, 1944, 
we landed on the island of Saipan. My unit were in, was in the first wave from Saipan, and we landed in Amtrax. And the policy was we'd move, move inland about 1,000, 1,200 yards, disembark and hold the line for the rest of the unit to come in. Well, my tractor got knocked out on the beach. We lost a track, so I had to decide what to do, either to do something there or to join the company. I thought the best thing to do was to join the company. That's what we were supposed to do. So I took my squad and we worked our way up and joined the company. There was not enough troops that made it to the war with mine. So they all brought us back down to the beach that night. And then from there on, it took us about 35, 36 days to take the island. And uh, you may or may not recall reading about what the Japanese did to the civilians there on that island, where they had Banzai Cliff, talked to the natives into throwing the children over the cliff and then jumping in themselves. Even a lot of them, they just gave them hand grenades and just took care of them that way. They had brainwashed the natives there so much that they were afraid that the Marines would do them harm. So we had, to, we had a problem with that. And we got, we got natives with a loudspeaker down in the water toward the end of the island and on, on shore also to talk to these people, tell them to uh, bring your troops out here and uh, bring your people on out here and you'll get water and be taken care of. I was still squad leader and they sent me out on a reconnaissance patrol. Uh, why me? I was a junior sergeant, I don't know, but anyway, I got out there and uh, I started getting too many civilians out, talking them out of caves. We, we learned enough language to we could at least talk about the cave. And so I got too many of that and I uh, called back to the company and told them, I said, well, uh, you need to send somebody here to pick these up or I need to bring them in. So they no, I said, no, you bring them on in. At the end of the battle, uh, my company commander called me in his office and said, uh, would you be willing to accept a battlefield commission of second lieutenant? That floored me because, like I say, I just paid sergeant, and we had plenty of senior sergeants, and in fact, my platoon sergeant was there. But anyway, I told him I'd be honored to do it. He said, okay, well, you go down to the battalion aid station and get you an exam. I went down there, and the doctor was asking me a few questions, and he says, uh, well, Hampton, he said, have you been here since day one? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you pass. So that was my exam. We moved back to Maui again to receive replacements and to continue training. We were headed for, headed for Iwo Jima. The Air Force, again, had problems. They kept saying, well, we're losing too many men and we're losing too many planes. And the reason was Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was about halfway between uh, Saipan, Tinian and Tokyo. And so, as you know, the, the Japanese fighter planes on the island, they had radar and they would notify Japan when our B-29s took off, and so they were able to attack the planes going and coming. So that's one reason why the Iwo Jima was so important for the B-29s. We got up to Iwo Jima on the way up there. My platoon sergeant, my gunnery sergeant, and one other sergeant was promoted to second lieutenant. So instead of seven officers from the company, we ended up with 10. But the only lasted nine days, I was the only one left. Lieutenant wasn't a very popular position to have at that time, I don't think. The battle on, the, on Iwo Jima was mostly uh, shrapnel. Everyone got hit by shrapnel. Very few people got hit by a bullet until toward the end of the battle. But it just depended on where you were, and because uh, the Japanese had every island, every four inch on that island, I think, zeroed in from, for artillery or mortars. It was just so, so much shrapnel all over that island all the time. Well, you might gain 10 or 15 yards one day, and the next day you might gain any. 
because of the, all their artillery mortars that they had. They even buried all their tanks. They didn't have the tanks to run anywhere, just had them buried. And the policy was that you will kill 10 people before you move, or you can, are allowed to move from your position. And about the ninth day, the executive officer of the company was wounded, and that left me to take over at that time. Before I knew it, I got a telephone call from the battalion. It said, Hampton, it says, there'll be a fire in your cap, you take that hill. <laughs> so, hell, I didn't know what to do. So I, I, I looked over whatever I had there, all the terrain we had. It was on Hill 382, if you ever heard anything about it. And uh, I placed my mortars, you know, to get right at the edge of the top of the hill, a bit lower, and I sent my machine, machine guns up to cover the top of the hill there. We were able to get up so far. But at the same time, we got about halfway up there and that's about all we could get because there's just too much, too much artillery everywhere and we didn't have anybody on their flanks. So the next day, they decided, well, they needed a captain and took my job. <laughs> so they transferred a captain in and took over the job. That night, we, the frontline units uh, had a big gap in their lines and they needed somebody to come up and fill it in. So, I took a reinforced platoon and started up there at night. And on the way up there, we ran across some troops, which we didn't know who they were when we first saw them. So I indicated, well, let's get close enough and I will find out if you got a password. So as soon as we asked them for the password, they knew who we were. And so they started throwing hand grenades at us. And I was the only one. I got hit by having laid up down on the left side. And uh, basically that's uh, my experience in Iwo Jima.